kids, what's going on? Nick DiPaolo, good to be back with you. What's happening? Last time I talked to you, uh, I was leaving from Minneapolis to shoot a uh, new DVD, new hour of new stuff, new to the public. Um, it was awesome. Acme Comedy Club, uh, talked about it before. It went down just as planned, if not better. Three show, three shows packed, and uh, couldn't have turned out better. Had a crew there. We had four different camera angles. They were great, and uh, just it, it's it's comedy mecca. That club. I wish the other owners would call this guy and learn how to run a club. <laughs> I mean, you're talking three shows sold out. Everybody pays to get in. None of this papering the room shit. Uh, I get paid nicely to, and almost, you know, pays for the whole project itself. Uh, guy couldn't be more fair. The staff is just tremendous um, during the shooting. You didn't even know they existed. Just it couldn't be more helpful during the day. Anything we needed. Just crazy. And, um, yeah, three shows. One on Monday night, two on uh, Tuesday. The, the first show on Tuesday, which is the second show of the three, it was just... I might just release that one from beginning to end. You know, what happens when you record three shows, you go into the editing and and you can, uh, you know, if this bit worked better on show one, you plug it in, uh, you know, vice versa. Uh, And uh, it can become a real pain in the ass because you drive yourself nuts. You're like, well, this this got a little bigger, bigger laugh. And I said this much smoother this way. But show three, you can go fucking mental. You'll be there for two years doing this. But uh, show two was so good, I'm thinking about just running it from beginning to end. I'll pick a few things here and there. There's always some ad libs that, you know, from all three shows that you might want to throw in. But uh, just killer, killer audiences. You know why? They don't judge. You say something off color or, they, or that goes against what, you know, their politics. You know, like, ooh, fucking New York is becoming my least favorite city to do stand up in lately, I'll tell you. And. I mean, I, I can't relate. I was at Gotham, which is a great club last night, but but on a Tuesday night, it's a different kind of crowd, you know, but it's all like, first of all, everybody's in their 20s. That's my problem. <laughs> That's who comes out. But uh, I can just see the makeup of the crowd. They just, you know, they just college, just college age kids who just fucking believe in all this horse shit. Um, this politically correct horseshit that they've, they've, they've grown up in. I mean, you do anything a little bit off color, they bristle at the most fucking mundane thing. It's just like shocking. It's like, don't you come out to hear some irreverent shit? Do, do you, do, or do you want to hear shit you can hear on ABC at eight o'clock on a Wednesday night, or, you know, from Disney? Um, it's just hilarious. I, 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 right in the middle of it last night at Gotham, I go, I, I, I fucking have nothing in common with you. I, I don't know. And I was, I was doing all right, but then, you know, some of the, all of a sudden it gets quiet. And I, I think I said the word rape. I looked at the, uh, the backdrop at, at Gotham. It's a kind of an ominous painting of the New York skyline. I go, that just screams rape, doesn't it? And it gets like, you could hear a pin drop. Like I actually raped somebody on stage. And then it takes like a minute to get them back just from saying something off the cuff. They get all fucking quiet and, uh, it's just, uh, you don't get that. I don't know. You get it. in a lot of cities, people, you know, think because I'm politically incorrect and my, uh, angry white male point of view, they are, people always go, you must kill like in Atlanta. And no, those cities are just as politically correct. Austin and, 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 uh, they're just so PC. People have bought into this horse shit. You'd think you'd come out to a club to uh, to uh, get away from that. But that's why I love this Acme Comedy Club in Minneapolis. They don't they don't bristle at anything. You say something, you know, a little mean or off color, and it gets just as big a laugh as it does. And that's going away, at least with my act. There's very few cities where I can, you know, cut loose, and they just don't judge you there. It's like comedy mecca. They They couldn't have been better. They were just fucking tremendous. And, uh, you know, no, no cell phones out, nothing. Just people sitting there. I don't even see anybody whispering to each other, like just totally undivided attention the the way it's supposed to be. I had called, uh, Opie and Anthony to, uh, to plug a gig last week, um, Tarrytown, which was great too. One of my favorite gigs. I did that Saturday night. And, uh, I mentioned to Jimmy Norton, he hadn't been to Acme yet. And I said, dude, that's going to be your next booking. Uh, you'll want to be there 10 times a year. So, uh, it was just, the shows were killer. 
all three of them, but this, I think the second one was the best. Um, as far as ad-libbing and shit, the third one, there was some good crowd interaction, but uh, c- couldn't have come out better. And I have all the stuff. The editing guy sent it to me. I've, I've watched all three shows. I'm so tired of this fucking material. If you guys knew the process, I mean, I've been playing with this material for you know a year and a half, and you're just so tired of it to begin with. Now to sit down and have to watch it again. Um, but uh, I'm excited how, how this thing came out. And uh, while we were there, um, we actually shot the cover that I'm going to use for the DVD. Um, I'm gonna. It's entitled "Another Senseless Killing," and uh, yeah, we, we shot the. T- I had a had a couple of cops. Minneapolis cops came in. I became friends with this cop who apparently was a big fan of mine in Minneapolis. He got shot up um, about a year ago, year and a half ago. Him and his partner got ambushed. He almost died. His partner killed the guy who was shooting at him. And, uh, yeah, this guy was a big fan of mine. And I got an email like a year ago from another cop on the force in Minneapolis, um, you know, saying, Hey, uh, this guy's a huge fan of yours. Can you, uh, send him a note, which I did. And, and then they came to the shows and, um, it was great actually included them. Um, so it, it was just awesome. Just friggin' awesome. And, uh, yeah, we took a photograph, um, kind of a graphic thing and it came out just the way I don't want to give it away, um, for the cover, but, um, <laughs> it involves some fake blood. Let's put it that way. Uh, it's going to be pretty cool. It came out just the way, it, um, we wanted it to. And, uh, it was just great freezing there friggin' freezing <laughs> the day we get there. It's like, I don't know, maybe 40 You get up the next day. It's like 11. It was just hilarious. Um, so cannot wait for that. Look for that. And uh, I'm going to get into the editing thing with a guy this week, and we're going to pound it out every night for probably, I don't know, it's going to take a month or two probably get it all together and, um, you know, and then shop it around. And uh, hopefully the same thing will happen that happened with Raw Nerve. It ended up on Showtime. So we'll go to, you know, we'll go to Netflix or uh, whoever, um, Epic, or whatever, all those. There's a million venues now that uh looking for content but i think this is going to be a doozy i don't get excited about much folks you know me i'm a fucking real debbie downer sometimes but uh it went down and uh yeah then saturday night i was in tarrytown at the tarrytown music hall theater right on main street which is one of my favorite gigs this real it's such a beautiful old theater and had a great time crowd was great my buddy Mike Baker shows up, my web guy with Google Glasses. You might have seen it on my uh, Twitter account. He comes in with Google Glasses, and it's like, I don't know. They they look cool, and but I'm not a big fan of that shit. I mean, there is no privacy left. This, this isn't going to help it. Um, my, uh, my buddy Louis C.K. mentioned he, he had already had an encounter with a, with a woman who was talking to him, and he sees like a little light blinking on her glasses. She was fucking recording him without telling him. So, uh, I don't like that idea at all, you know, with the, when the fuck does it end, man? But, um, you know, they are cool looking, but, uh, it's helping destroy us. I think <laughs> there's no, there's no way you can go to do anything. I mean, where's it end? You're going to be on a train or a bus. Somebody's just staring at you, recording you and shit. going to have to stay in the house. Well, then you look at the flip side, you can record, you know, you can go outside and somebody can play that knockout game and knock you fucking silly. And uh, hopefully somebody have Google glasses on when that happens and and catch the scumbags. We'll get into that in another episode, OK, because that's another whole episode, the old knockout game. And um, that we could spend two hours on, but uh, I don't want to get kicked out of showbiz quite yet. <laughs> Oh, Lordy. So, yeah, look for that. I, I think uh, after all the editing and shit, that'll be out in hopefully beginning of next year if everything goes well. Um, what has happened uh, what, over the weekend sports-wise? Well, you all saw the Pats game Monday night against Carolina. And uh, before we get to the controversial call, I'll tell you, Bill Belichick, this, this has to be, it reminds me of what Girardi did with the Yankees this year. Uh, having unbelievable amount of injuries and 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 still keeping the Yanks competitive up till the end there, when they went in the dumper. <laughs> uh, but uh, what a job Girardi did and uh, Belichick. You can compare this to one of his best coaching jobs ever. I mean, the, the Pats are banged up. Will Four, 
Okay, the guy's a perennial all pro, gone. Gerard Mayo, our best linebacker, best defensive player. He's led the team in tackles for like the last three years, out for the season. Tom Kelly, another great defensive lineman we had this year, out for the season. I mean, just, uh, you know, Gronk for the first four or five games and rookie rookie wide receivers. So uh, I think it's been an unbelievable job by the very personable Bill Belichick <laughs> and uh, Brady, too. I mean, uh, Carolina's a real deal, no doubt about it, but that that was a fucking travesty. I don't give a shit if you hate the Patriots or not. I'm sure I'll be hearing from Jets and Giants fans. But um, that was a tra- that, that, that wasn't interference. That was actually a mugging or a rape is what, what it was. Uh, hilarious that they picked that flag up. And then you got that dumb old referee in the booth going, the ball was uncatchable. Yeah, it was uncatchable because he was being mugged. Guy's six fucking five, 245, athletic. He can get to any ball within 10 feet of him. And uh, that was a travesty. And I'm, I'm glad our boy Brady let the refs have it. Like, that, that's all over the uh, like internet and on the news. Like, that's, like, that's a big deal. <laughs> like, he's not supposed to get pissed off. Uh, and the refs are right next to him on the way off the field. What, are you not going to let, let him have it? But um, Caroline is good, but, uh, you know, they don't scare me. Good team. And uh, Cam Noten, the real deal, man. He looked uh, great. Hold on. Let me check my settings here. All right. Looked like the light went off. Um, Cam Noten, yeah, he was the real deal. The guy's unbelievably athletic, can throw the ball, can run crazy. But the Patriots, you know what? They hung in there. They hung in there, and uh, we'll see what happens come playoff time. I mean, who's going to, who are they competing with? Fucking Buffalo Bills, who routed the Jets, who are the saddest excuse for football. The Jets have stunk for so long, it's just unbelievable. I mean, how do you get fucking beat up by the Buffalo Bills? The whole league is like that, though. They show up for work one week, they don't, they don't the next. The Texans getting beat by the Raiders. How do you lose to the fucking Oakland Raiders? And then the Packers, huh? What happens? So you start a quarterback was done. You're going you're gonna, to, what, call it quits for the season? Go up against the most mediocre Giants team in the last 20 years and get your asses handed you because Rodgers isn't there? It's just a disappointing league. It's just so much fucking mediocrity. It's just horrible. I, I can't figure out the 49ers either, man. What their problem? And that was the other thing. Besides the uh, the travesty of a call against the Patriots, how about Brady getting him down there though, like he always does? They just uh, him and Belichick are creepy. It reminds me of Tom Landry and Roger Staubach. For you people who were in your late eighties, like myself, uh, in the seventies, they were the unbelievable combination. Or you know Chuck Knoll and Bradshaw with the Steelers, or Don Shula and Bob Greasy. Yeah, I remember watching those guys as a kid and just hating their guts. Going, when are these fucking people going to go away? They're so good every year. And uh, Belichick and Brady, have just it's unbelievable what they're pulling off. But, uh, yeah, good for Carolina. Um, the 49ers game against the Saints, that's the other one. That call against, was it Brooks? What is happening to football, man? The guy, the linebacker Brooks for uh, the 49ers, tackles, uh, you know, who Breeze. Up around that chest area. It wasn't a clothesline to the throat. He hit him in the chest with his arm and then slid his arm up. And it looked more vicious than it was in my opinion. They used to be a good tackle in the 70s. Fred the Hammer Williamson used to lay people out. But uh, that cost them the game. They get penalized for that. Next, you know, uh, Saints are in field goal position, whatever. But... uh, I'm with Brooks, man. He was quoted after the game saying, I basically bear hugged him. That's just how football is played. I think this shit is bullshit football. <laughs> the way they call this stuff these days, it's watered down. It ain't real no mo. And he's exactly fucking right. That's what lawyers have done. That's what lawyers have done. Because the league's afraid of concussions. And Jesus Christ, they guard the quarterbacks like they're 10-year-old girls with leukemia. Let them fucking play, will you? I mean, it really is. It's just this, whether it's bullying in school, whatever the fuck. It's just lawyers are so entrenched in our society. Everybody's so afraid of getting sued that we're just taking the fun out of everything. I would have loved to see 
Breeze's head come off his shoulders, you know? Would have been beautiful. Bullshit call. I had picked the 49ers to uh, win the Super Bowl at the beginning of this year. I'm still not ruling it out, man. They get some big, fast, athletic guys. But um, so that was uh, that. Was that. What the hell else? Um, I just uh, I just um, picked up three, two dead mice. I have traps all over the place. I'm in the, <laughs> I live in the woods, so when the weather gets cold, and I talked about this, it was a bit on my album, but, uh, you know, you have to put down mice traps in your basement, and uh, my wife, you know, just totally scared shitless of mice. I don't get that fair, but anyways... Um, so it's, it's hilarious. I come downstairs the next morning after I set them, I'm like a fisherman checking my, my traps and I have a method. I, I take the dead mice out of the traps and I bring them outside. First of all, you get them with peanut butter, not cheese. You put peanut butter. I, I used to do a bit. It was true. My wife was putting, uh, imported Parmesan Reggiano cheese in the fucking traps. And, uh, I freaked out on it cause that stuff's what, 14 bucks a pound, whatever the fuck. But I catch the mice, I bring the traps outside, and I, I dump the dead mice out on, like, my patio, which is facing uh, this pond on our, yeah. And I I have a hockey stick, and I shoot the dead mice into the pond, and it's fun. So, and uh, then you see 12 Canadian geese out there. I don't think they eat mice, but <laughs> I don't know what the fuck's going on. But uh, I had two, had two today. Mm-mm. I don't know what the... What's so scary about a, a mouse, you know? The fucking wife freaks out. It looks like every gerbil I had as a kid. Well, they carry bacteria and ger- Yeah, well, I'm not fucking French kissing them. Jesus Christ, they're afraid of you. You know, every once in a while, you might see one out of the corner of your eye when you're watching TV at night. Again, downstairs. They don't make it upstairs. Thank Christ. Because that's where we do most of our living. Um, but uh, it's fun. I'll be watching, uh, like I'm watching the Bruins game last night, and I hear, Snap! And I go over by the uh, boiler in the other room. That's where I put the drafts now. I think they have a fucking red carpet entrance over there. And uh, snap! I heard two within a half hour. And, uh, yeah, shot them into the pond. And uh, haven't heard anything since. Got more peanut butter, laid it on there. We used to live... It's a good segue. We used to live across the street. Are the people... This family, they were called the Melvin. I'll say the Melvins. It's close to their real name. Um, but they lived across the street from us where I was growing up in Massachusetts. And they were, um, they were, uh, there was a lot of mental illness. And it's kind of relevant to today. You saw the, um, the senator from Virginia a couple of days ago. His son stabbed him and then killed himself. Cray Deeds, I think his name was. His son was Gus. And uh, mental illness is in the news every day. I don't know if that kid was mentally ill, but he had problems. And the lady, uh, you know, a month ago, the lady in D.C. with a car. Remember the cops had to shoot her? And then the guy that shut up the Navy. Mental illness is running crazy. Well, the Melvins were, uh, they were a family. They were incestuous. They married, <laughs> there was two families, okay? The Melvins lived right across from right across from us, and right next to them was the the Bankses, and they were in they were related somehow. Still not sure of the connection, but they had been there since my dad was a kid. Okay, and my grandparents' house is next to our house, so so my grandparents lived across the street from the Bankses, and we lived across the street from the Melvins, and um, it's the it was just a they were the mentally ill. They were but they, they were funny. They, I, I tell these stories. Colin Quinn always requests these. Um, there was George Melvin. He was like uh, probably he was probably in his thirties when we were like ten or twelve years old. He wore a leather jacket, but he had the m- mentality of a six or seven year old boy. And you know, <laughs> he had like a leather jacket. He was missing his upper front teeth. He always used to smoke camels. He had like a scar over his lip. He looked like a, a scary dude, but he was like the nicest. Like I said, he had the mentality of a seven-year-old boy. He used to play street hockey with us. God damn it, I forgot to hang up the phone. He used to play street hockey with us and, um, uh, you know, kickball, all this shit. While he's smoking a camel cigarette. Just picture that. It was the funniest fucking thing. He'd come up to me. How you doing, Nicky? Rub dirty hands in my hair and rub my fucking head. Smoking his cigarette. And and then would, you know, would, would get into like a, a, a tomato fight. 
My dad had a tomato garden, and we'd get into a, me and the neighborhood kids start throwing tomatoes at each other, and George would join in, and somebody would drill him in the head. He would literally get pissed and run home and tell his mother. Picture a guy in his 30s telling his mother. And then his mom would come out on the porch. They had this porch and stand there with her arms crossed and fucking curse us out. And then we'd start throwing shit at her. But that was George. Okay, there's a whole family of them. Then, uh, then there was Ernie Melvin. Um, he was, I don't know, he was George's, I think, older brother. Anyways, he lived between the Banks' house and the Melvin's house in a self-built trailer that he built out of wood and shit. Okay, picture this. I know, what a beautiful neighborhood. And he, uh, he lived in that trailer with his daughter, uh, Darlene. And um, she used to tell us that he would um, have sex with her. Isn't that fucking crazy? And we're like, what are you talking about? Well, you know, and, and yeah, he used to use like a plastic baggie for a condom with with his uh, with his own daughter, mind you. OK. And, uh, w- you know, we used to throw shit at the at, at the um, at the trailer. All the neighborhood kids would throw shit rocks and and um, <laughs> Ernie was just crazy. He used to ride his daughter's bike. Picture this. It's a lime green girls like stingray bike with a basket on it. He would ride that around town. He was like, you know in his 40s or 50s at the time. Just fucking insane. And they'd been there since, like I said, my dad was a kid, the Melvins. And then um, one day I come outside. It's around five, six at night to play, you know, with with the other neighborhood kids. And uh, Ernie pulls up in his Falcon station wagon and there's a pony, a pony, folks, stuffed in the back of the station wagon. A fucking pony. (laughs) <laughs> can you make this shit up a pony which you know he kept tied up in his yard later on but um i mean what the fuck and the thing grew you know like into a horse and um it got loose one day me and my buddy paul grant were having lunch in my house we go outside to play street hockey in my driveway and we see what coming right at us the fucking horse Next thing you know, the cops come down the street. The horse ran up the street and uh, almost got hit by a car and all the shit. Ernie got in trouble for having, you can't just have a horse anywhere, I guess. I don't know the fucking rules, but just crazy. Okay. Now, next to the Melvins was the Bankses. And uh, they were somehow related. And, you know, my dad explained that later on there was some incest going on or some shit. That's where the mental illness came from. I don't know. But uh, Elsie and George Banks, I think was the name, and um, Elsie was a lady, this is fucking hilarious, every night when the sun started to go down, she'd come outside in like this creepy dress, not even a dress, like like a nightgown, like a dirty nightgown, she had no teeth, she had greasy hair, and she would sing the national anthem. We could see it through the trees. The house had trees in front of it. It was just creepy. And and she would sing the national anthem at like 5 o'clock every night, Elsie. <laughs> and we would just fucking, neighborhood kids would just be out there laughing our balls off. You know, we'd salute like when, when they played the national anthem before a football game. And Elsie would sing with the creepiest fucking voice. And my grandfather hated these motherfuckers because he, you know, they had been there since he, he built his house there. <laughs> and he used to get into it with a... Uh, George Banks, George or Edward, I can't remember. I think it was, I don't know, but Mr. Banks uh, used to, like, um, when it would snow and rain real hard, he would direct the snow and rain uh, towards my grandfather's yard. So I remember my grandfather going out there with a shovel and and them getting into, like, a pushing match. My grandfather was in his 80s at the time. (laughs) This is so crazy. Um but yeah, so uh, just a creepy, and then there was, uh, so you had Ernie Melvin, you had George Melvin, and then another brother, Johnny, he was the mechanic in the family, and um, he would fix cars and trucks, and it was a pigsty, we hated living across the street from him, and uh, but every, after the first snow, after the first real snowstorm, he'd come every year, he'd come pulling out of the back in like this fucking plow that he he built on his own with like a lawnmower engine and shit and with plywood he would sit like five feet up high on it it was the funniest fucking 
It was like a homemade sit-down snowplow. The guy was like a genius with his hands, and you would never see him. Um, but he'd come out and, 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 and fucking plow the driveway in this makeshift homemade snowplow slash lawnmower thing. It was it would sit up he'd sit up like five feet in the air on this high seat and we would just fucking howl and throw ice balls at him and and uh it, they were just it was the cra- again George was the friendly one but fucking Ernie was crazy and it just just creeped this just a creepy family it, literally what what brought this story on was the mice they used to have only they would have rats in their front yard and and you know would be throwing rocks at the rats and shit. Literally, Mrs. Melvin would come out on the porch and go, leave them alone. Like, it was like living next to the Munsters. She would scream at us for throwing rocks at rats on her property. We thought we, we, thought we were doing her a favor. Leave them alone. That was, those were her pets. And, and, um, and then there was another one. We never figured out who this guy was, if he was an uncle or whatever. A taxi cab would pull up. This would happen a couple times a year. A taxi cab would pull up. This is 70s now, okay, mid-70s to early 70s. And the driver, would, cab driver would get out, and you'd see him. He'd take out two artificial legs and carry them into the house and then carry this guy into the house with no no legs. They were like wooden fucking make sure. I, I don't know what. But it turns out my dad told me this guy was another part of the family. I can't remember if he was an uncle or what, but he was an alcoholic. Passed out on train tracks. In, in, in a town next to ours, and, and a train ran over his legs. That that was the story behind this guy. But he was a relative of theirs. But you see the guy carrying these, like, plastic legs or whatever, and then carry this fucking guy in with no legs. And and uh, I don't know if he was still drinking at th- that time or what. We never got his name. My old man would probably know. But they would just, if, like, George, like I said, we had fun with George, but he'd get pissed at us and start hitting him with tomatoes and... And we, of course, we were mean as kids. We're throwing shit at their house at night and, and throwing, you know, fucking rotten zucchinis from my grandmother's garden onto their porch. And they're coming out swearing. And then George wouldn't talk to us for like, you know, a couple of weeks at a time. And then he'd be friendly again. <laughs> but just picture a guy playing street hockey who's 25 years older than the rest of us. So like with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. I mean, just classic fucking classic. Um. But she would get pissed at us, you know, scaring her rats. Isn't that very uh, monster like Adam's family like? You can't make that shit up. And then one day they up and left. It was unfriggin believe. My dad saw a moving truck and he goes, my dad goes, you got to be shitting me. It's like a, fr- a Friday night. He sees a moving truck. And he goes, I think they might be. And, and, and sure enough, they start packing this shit. What the fuck was that? Ah, it's my iPad. Um, <laughs> I'm a real tech whiz, aren't I? And all of a sudden, they pack up the next two days. They pack up all the shit after being there for I don't know how many years. Can you imagine? My, my grandmother had tears in her eyes. And um, yeah, they pull away with the U-Haul with their garbage in it. And <laughs> never forget... They pull away in a Falcon station wagon. And, and, and me and my brother are throwing to George is waving to us out the window. The back window like a little kid. You know, we're fucking throwing apples at their car or whatever. Oh, my God. Just up and left. My uncle now has a house on that property. Right after. they We cleaned out. Bulldozer came down, knocked over. And another guy, a uh, roofer. Knocked over where the banks lived, and, and, and they cleaned up the lots. There's two beautiful houses in there. My old man was in shock. I never saw my man speechless in his life. The fucking Melvins were gone, and the banks were gone. And most of the personality of the neighborhood was gone. I'm surprised now. I'm looking back on it that my parents let me and my brother hang out with George. You know, today that would never happen. You don't know if the guy's a sex offender or not. <laughs> parents didn't give a shit back then. Yeah, hey, go play with George. Go play with the 35-year-old mentally ill guy who smokes camels. You'll be fine. What could happen? Can you imagine that today? Holy shit. A lot of that stuff going around. It's, uh, man, that, yeah, that senator, that poor bastard in Virginia. Got stabbed by his own kid and, and, uh, I don't know. It's a slippery slope. You can't, uh, intervene on people's privacy. You can't check out their records. Although with Obamacare, apparently uh, anybody can have access to your personal 
medical records now. So that's another whole show that we won't get into because I don't want to hear it from you left-wing douchebags on the, um, you know, on Twitter. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, my grampy, that was Rocco DiPaolo. That's my middle name, named after my grandfather, my dad's dad. He put up with those idiots for uh, his whole friggin' life. But, um, and what a character my grandfather was, Mamma Mia. Rocco. Give you an idea, typical old school guinea I'm a kid. I'm uh, I'm helping him in his tomato garden. He used to have like 300 plants. Even till the age of 89, he had, had that big of a, a garden. And uh, one day I'm helping him. I'm 12 years old. My grandfather falls and cracks his head open, okay, on a rock. And uh, no little gash either. It's like dripping in his hair and it's dripping down his face. And I'm like, Grampy, you might have to, you know, get some stitches. Never mind. You get back to work, you son of a bitch. And he literally reaches down and grabs a handful of dirt and packs it into the cut on the on, on the side of his head to stop the bleeding. <laughs> and we go back to work and, you know, for the next couple hours. And then uh, we grew up next to my grandparents. So I, I go down, uh, this is three three hours later, I go, I go down for dinner, you know, having dinner with my, my family. And I said, hey, Dad, uh, Grampy fell down, cut his head. You might want to go up there and, and check it out. My father goes up there, picture this now, he walks in my grandparents' house, my grandmother and grandfather at the table having supper, and my grandfather sitting there with the dirt still packed in the side of his head. (laughs) And I remember my grandmother and my dad trying to wrestle him to the kitchen sink. He's literally putting up a fight. I'm okay, I don't need another. And just, uh, you know, they're trying to rinse his head off with a hose in the sink and shit. Unfriggin', talk about old school. Oh. He used to fucking, he, he just uh, didn't believe in doctors, man. He fell off a building. Uh, he was building uh, the United Shoe in Beverly, Massachusetts, which was a big factory at the time. He was helping build it, and the, the uh, scaffolding collapsed from like three stories, and he broke his back and legs and said that, you know, first they told him that he might not have a walk, walk again. He was out of the hospital like less than two months and, um, you know, walk with a limp for the rest of his life, but uh, just a just a tough old bug, man cut off the uh he cut off the three middle fingers on his right hand so he only had a thumb and a pinky finger he cut him off in a table saw accident at the united shoe he went to work in the factory that he helped build and he and he and he cut those off and um yeah and and they put him in like they back they didn't even try to sew him on back then you know he had him though he had him in a piece of paper in his pocket <laughs> uh but just absolutely loved the old Rocco. We used to go bowling. We'd walk a mile and a half, two miles to a bowling alley. Guys, in it was in his mid-80s at the time, okay? And he used to get pissed because he couldn't. I'm talking Candlepin. That's uh, bowling that was very popular in New England. And the ball's like the size of a softball. And uh, he used to take me and my brother bowling. Everybody loved him. He'd bring tomatoes from his garden and wine that he made. Uh, to the bowling alley, and they wouldn't charge him to bowl. He could. They, they were so in love with my grandpa, they'd let him fucking bowl all day, not charge him anything. And uh, he's trying to throw a ball with a thumb and a pinky finger, you know, and, and half of them went in the gutter, and he'd start cursing, you know. And, and a lot of times he'd beat us, too. <laughs> uh, what a character, man. Yeah, made his own wine. He used to still have a grapevine my sister now lives in the house they regutted it and built my uh my sister lives with her family right next door to my parents and there's a great grapevine in the yard still that my grandfather brought over from italy that we still have cookouts under and eat under and um used to make wine in his basement and i used to step on the grapes you realize i was so italian did you folks i'm only half actually French, Canadian, English on my mother's side. My dad's all Italian. But uh, yeah, used to make around Easter time. My grandfather would make wine from the grapes that he grew and uh, grapes that he bought also. And uh, yeah, we would, would step on them. Not in our bare feet. Okay, that's hack. We had rubber boots that were sterilized. My grandmother used to boil them or some shit. Because you, 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 know, you step on the shit in your bare feet, you'll have purple feet for the next 10 years. And uh, yeah. You know, let the kids step on the grapes. And, and one Easter, my sister came from church. My sister Donna fell in the grapes in her Easter dress. My old man lost his shit. It was the funniest thing I ever saw in my life. I don't know how the fuck she got close enough to fall in it. 
but uh, made his own wine and used to drink uh, two to three glasses, usually two. And I'm talking like 16-ounce glasses with his meal. And then uh, one night, we're having dinner, me and my family, down at our house. My grandmother comes down, and she's crying, and she has red marks on her neck. And my father's like, Ma, what happened? You stupid a father. He drank a three glasses of wine, and he wanted to dance. My grandfather wanted my grandmother to dance with him, and she refused, and he tried to choke her. He was 89 years old at the time. <laughs> the passion was still there, folks. <laughs> my father had to go up and chew him out. Apparently, he drank almost a whole bottle that night. And uh, what's funny is he told us, my grandfather, you know, told us that's what kept him alive, and it was so good for you, which is so funny because he was way ahead of his time. I mean, that's, you know, you hear that now from doctors to have a couple glasses of red wine antioxidants and all that shit in the grapes and uh who knew we used to go the old man's fucking crazy and uh my grandmother matilda another character here's why she was a character when she when she laughed she used to go <laughs> and we used to i always used to say me and my brother used to say and my sisters this uh you know i think grammy smoked cigarettes because she has that you know and 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 my father would be like what are you crazy we live next door. Have you ever seen her with a cigarette? We're like, no. And 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 uh, my uncle Al used to say the same thing. My uncle Al used to accuse my my grandmother of smoking. That was my dad's brother. And we always used to, you know, me and my brother thought he might have been right. And my dad's like, you're crazy. And my sisters. And um, you know, we never caught her smoking cigarettes and shit. And uh, so we didn't really have any evidence of that. But she had that that's that la- that raspy thing. Anyways, she passes away in uh, 1988. I think it was. And my old man's going through her stuff in her house down in the basement and shit, you know, finding old pictures and recipes and stuff. And uh, what do we find down there? Like uh, 10 bo- ten cartons of, uh, of uh, Marlboro Lights. Okay? She's like Livia Soprano, old school gangster. She had us all fooled. No doubt she smoked. <laughs> my uncle Al's like, I told you. What did I fucking tell you? She was a smoker. Never caught, never, never smelt it on her, and never anything. Doesn't say much for us, brains wise. But uh, it was great living next to those two. She died in uh, '88. My grandfather died in 1978. He was 93 at the time. Lived till he was 93. Was always healthy. Even with sticking mud in his head. Um, yeah, lived till he was 93. 78. We were up at camp. It was a very sad day. We were up in, uh, we used to go up to a camp in uh, New Hampshire on a lake and go water skiing for the week. You know, that was our vacation for a few years back then. And um, sure enough, uh, when we were up there, he passed away. It's the first time I saw my dad actually cry. And, um, you know, it was uh, we packed that stuff up and, and, and went home. And uh, he was the balls, man. Rocco de Paolo. He's just uh, quite the guy. What the hell else uh, that I want to talk about? Um, let's talk about, oh, my boy Alec Baldwin. <laughs> this guy. Do you feel like we're coming apart as a society? I mean, but the, the shit that's going on is just fucking... But I got to be honest with you, with Alec Baldwin, who, yeah, yeah, he's a liberal jerk off and I hate his politics and he's, and he's a hypocrite because, you know, he'll, he'll, def, you know, he'll shit on anybody who doesn't think like him politically, but then, you know, he's snapping on people using gay slurs. But as far as the paparazzi thing goes, you know, oh, oh, I'm almost on his side. I, I, I just fucking hate these people that can get into your face like that i i think there's got to be a, a better way of doing it but uh he went off on some woman reporter well here, here it is you're the one that almost hit my wife with the microphone I in the face I, I asked you a question her. you want to apologize to her i asked you a question get the f- out of here i do want to press charges against her she assaulted my wife Johnny, it's a car. <laughs> that's where he loses me when he says i want to uh, you know press charges Salt to my wife. This lady put a microphone in his wife's face and, uh, you know, didn't hit her, didn't make contact. 
but these fucking paparazzi, I know they have a job to do, but really, this six years have to get within an inch of his car and shit? I mean, get the fuck out of here. And they're hoping, what they're hoping, one of these famous people pops him in the mouth, and then they can get a nice payday. Once again, the lawyers make life just fucking miserable. But, uh, yeah, he's a hypocrite, and, and you know, using gay sl- And finally, MSNBC came around, you know, after, uh, you know, fucking lynching Paula Dean and how horrible a person she was, um, you know, you heard nothing. How many times has Alec Baldwin said shit like this and, and got away with it? So it's finally to the point where even they had to uh, boot him off his... Uh, <laughs> he supposedly suspended from his new show on MSNBC. But um, I don't know. I like people with tempers. And people get in your face like that. I don't know. In the perfect world, you should be able to smack them without getting sued. So, uh, but, uh, did you hear what he said? He calls a guy a, a cocksucker and a faggot. And he goes, I said fathead. Oh my God. Come on, Alec. Just say, yeah, I lost my temper and I said it. What, what is this? This is getting ridiculous now. So what the F word is the new N word. Is that, is that where we are? Are there any words left that white heterosexual males can say? I mean, Jesus Christ. So, uh, you know. So MSNBC had the boots. It's going to be hilarious. Eventually, there's going to be nobody left to do TV shows, radio, or anything because we keep taking words away. They're only fucking words, folks. You're giving them way too much power. They can't hurt you. They really can't unless you're a mental midget and a weakling. They're fucking words, okay? You say shit. When you when you lose your temper and you're in an argument or fight, you, yeah, you want to say stuff that's hurtful. So you're gonna, right? It's the beauty of this country. You used to be able to get away with it. We're gonna become Canada. I mean, how about Canada? I mean, there's there's a they have speech codes up there. Some comedian a few years ago literally got arrested for picking on lesbians at a comedy show who were yelling shit out and he zinged them back like you're supposed to and he got arrested for it. And we're fucking headed that way. That's what it looks like. As long as the uh, left-wing douchebags are in power because uh, that's where political correctness comes from, by the way. And this knockout game, uh, it's not a brand new thing. They're all acting shocked and shit. It's been going on for a couple fucking years but the media, the cowards in the media have been ignoring it so don't act like it's a brand new thing. All right? But uh, as far as uh, Canada goes and speech goes, I want. <laughs> how about how about was it Mayor Ford of Toronto, <laughs> the crack smoking mayor? Holy shit! Even uh, Marion Barry was a little more low key. <laughs> you didn't see Marion Barry running over people, and uh, oh, did you see him running over that lady? They were in uh, you know some whatever the House of Congress is uh, up in Canada. He runs over some councilwoman. Oh, God, if Chris Farley was alive. Bobby Moynihan, you're doing a great job with it, but Farley was just, you know, come on. They were almost like twins. But um, how about him going? Yeah, she accused me of eating her pussy. I uh, have enough to eat at home. The guy's actually funny. He's 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 saying he's not an addict, but it sure seems like it's an he's an addict that's unraveling right in public, you know, which, hey, it's fucking entertaining. I don't know, I think he... I think he lowered taxes like two years in a row up there and shit. So the people like him. He says he's not going anywhere. I don't know. But uh, I hope he sticks around for a while. And uh, Coke drip. Um, The hell else? Yeah, I was going to do this podcast yesterday, but I'm so bad with computer. I'm not computer illiterate. Okay. But I'm pretty damn close with some shit. My fucking, I sat down yesterday at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon to bang this out, and my mouse doesn't work. And, you know, I'm like, huh. The light's on. It's not blinking. Does it have a battery? I, I fucking I push this little trap door open on the mouse. There's no battery. I don't, I don't know how the fuck it works. It was just, uh, I don't know. I'm there for a half hour trying to play with my mouse. It's not doing anything. Then he stuck a pen in the reset button. And that didn't work, and then I'm getting really getting upset. Went upstairs and had a cup of coffee, which makes me more angry. Came back down. Then I'm trying to pull sound clips, you know, and um, just shit that somebody who who knows even a little bit about computers could have figured out. And uh, I had like a sound clip. Well, this is a clip, you know. What the hell's going on? 
going on here? That's from my uh, show back in New York on Free FM. I uh, I uh, had that clip somewhere in my iTunes. I could see it, but I couldn't move it to where I wanted to put it into whatever the fuck. And just played with that for like an hour and a half. As that's going on, I'm getting emails from the guy who who's going to ed- help edit my uh, stuff. He's sending me the shows. I start watching them. I go back to this. I can't figure out. The toolbar is gone. I'm trying to convert a YouTube clip. All of a sudden, the, I can't find the, the fucking the toolbar where you put the link in to convert. I mean, just minor shit that, again, if there was a 12-year-old next to me, could have figured out probably in 10 seconds. I look up. It's like 6 o'clock at night. So I just ended up watching all the shit that they sent me from Minneapolis. And uh, so this, this show would have been out. Uh, should have been out by last night. I'm trying to release them. I'm trying to release them, folks, on uh, on the same day. That's the way to do it. Makes it easy on you guys, I guess. But sometimes uh, life gets in the way. Your schedule doesn't allow it. And I love you people on uh, Twitter that are going, hey, your podcasts are getting better. And I, and I appreciate the uh, the encouragement, but it's, you know, I, I did have a radio show, okay, in New York City, right? And I had no sidekick or anything where I, I just did it myself for three hours, taking phone calls and talking politics, okay, in the biggest radio market in the world. So I, I do know how to broadcast. But like I said, this is just the beginning of the podcast where uh, eventually we want to do the stuff live and I'll have more to play off of. You know, we'll have you guys calling in and, um, yeah, we'll have a live phone line and, you know, eventually have guests and stuff. So um, there'll be a lot more a lot more going on and to play with. But I appreciate the encouragement, but it's not the first time I'm behind a microphone. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I appreciate you. And apparently a lot of people are already subscribing. So. We're going to have fun. It, it'll get it'll, it'll get more controversial as we go on. Well, you know, I'll get into more topical shit. I just uh, get tired of fighting with people on Twitter. And, uh, you know, but uh, it's getting crazy out there, isn't it? With the whole, uh, uh, the whole, I don't know, the whole knockout thing and uh, Obamacare and uh, have we ever been more divided as a nation? It's just fucking crazy, isn't it? Isn't what the hell's going on out here? I don't know. I don't know. But if you had listened to, if you were a fan of my uh, Free FM radio show back in 2007, that's what we did. We talked a lot of topical stuff, a lot of politics, but it's so hard to do now because everybody's so divided. I mean... We weren't exactly united back then, but now, holy fucking moly. I think you're either a fan of government or you're not. I say we all revolt. Let's get rid of it, as much of it as we can. I just read this today, a little disturbing. Some driver in Fort Worth, uh, Fort Worth, Texas, there was a roadblock, police roadblock, directing people into parking lot. They were asked by federal contractors for samples of their breath, saliva, and even blood was part of a government research study aimed at t- determining the number of drunken or drug-impaired drives. Yeah, sure it was. Get the fuck out of here. Do you, you, do you believe you know how wrong that is, pulling you over for nothing randomly, pulling you over and taking saliva? To, why would you say yes to that? They were, they were interviewing this woman, Kim Cope, her name was. She says, it just doesn't seem right that you can be forced off the road when you're not doing anything wrong. No, it isn't right. You know? So just say, no, I'm not, I'm not fucking doing it. She said once she was parked, she couldn't believe what she was asked. They were asking for cheek swabs. Are you fucking kidding me? What is going on? You get $10 for a cheek swab, and they take your blood. They give you $50 for that. All in the guise of, of uh, studying, you know, drunken or drug-impaired drivers. Bullshit. If you believe that, you're fucking crazy. So if anybody does that, just refuse it, Okay. There's no way you're not going to win that lawsuit. Well, who knows today. But uh, talk about the government up your ass. They're doing a review of all the police actions uh, of the the personnel of the Fort Worth Police Department. Sure they are. I'm sure they are. This is, uh, they're going to do this in 30 cities across the country in an effort to reduce impaired driving accidents. Hey, we live in a fucking world with his risks, okay? You're not going to ever have a risk-free world. So can we stop with the horse shit? The taking away of trans fats and checking my saliva for fucking alcohol in the middle of the day. What the fuck is going on? 
So uh, I can't wait. I hope that goes to court. I hope she takes it all the way. This is getting frightening, isn't it, folks? So fuck the government is what I say. That's about it. I'm tapped. Got to sit down now and again, look at a lot of footage from Minneapolis. Can't hear these jokes one more time. I'm going to poop. But uh, it was successful. Uh, Look for it in a couple months. Thanks for uh, tuning in again, kids. I'll try to get these out to you every Tuesday or Wednesday at the latest. Again, based on my ineptness of technology. And um, I will see you. uh, Where's my next gig? Uh, Parsippany. This Friday night at the comedy shop. Don't have (laughs) really organized. This is why. Never was a big marketer. Friday night, the comedy shop, Parsippany, New Jersey, off a route, I don't know, 702, 706 or some shit. Um, what else do I have coming up? That's about it for now. And I'll see you in the city if you come into the comedy cellar or any of those, but I'm um, doing less of that because I'm not interested in doing 15-minute uh, sets anymore. If I can't be on stage for a half hour, it's almost not worth it, you know? takes me 15 minutes just to get warmed up on stage so uh gonna be doing less of that gotta gotta find a place locally where i can up here i don't have to drive 45 minutes into the city where i can cut loose for a half hour to 45 minutes you know that's how you get work on new material it's hard to do it 15 minutes at a time it does work and if you live right in the city like i used to it's a lot easier to jump in a cab and go to a club two seconds later you're there but uh yeah, there's a million ways to skin a cat, folks. Nick DiPaolo, uh, nice talking to you guys. And uh, I will talk to you uh, next week. All right? So uh, in the meantime, let's go paint a bicycle. Goodbye, everybody. Uh-